Okay, thank you guys. We're gonna get started with the second session or the second panel of today's event. Uh, thank you for coming back in from coffee and treats. Um, so moving away or moving in sort of in a slightly different direction, the second panel is focusing on the primate origins of human decisions um, and brings together three scientists working on quite different aspects of decision making in non-human primates, as well as a little bit of work in human primates. So our first speaker today is Sarah Brosnan. Um, Sarah Brosnan is, is an associate professor of psychology, philosophy, and neuroscience uh, at Georgia State University. And her work um, explores mechanism, the mechanisms that underlie cooperation, reciprocity, inequity, and a whole suite of other kinds of economic decisions in non-human and now increasingly starting to work in human primates. Um, and she does all of this from an evolutionary perspective. And one of the things that I really like about Sarah's work um, is the degree to which it really highlights the interdisciplinarity that we see in the social sciences. So from her affiliations, you can see how interdisciplinary she is, but it really also comes out both in where she publishes, the service she does as, a, as editors at journals like the Proceedings of the Royal Society B, biological sciences, animal cognition, evolutionary psychology, science, um, as well as journals like social justice research and frontiers in decision neuroscience. Um, in addition to a whole suite of accolades, um, Sarah also has the perhaps, well, I, it's a distinction of having what I think is actually the, the best video of a scientific result ever put on the internet, uh, which you guys are all gonna have the chance to see today, uh, and which as of, as of this morning when I checked had nearly 750,000 indiv individual hits. So, Sarah, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Meg. Um, I'm really excited to be here and to get the chance to tell everybody what I've been working on. I think an institute on social sciences is an absolutely fantastic idea. Um, obviously, I fit right into the, to the idea of doing these as a group rather than in individual disciplines. And today, what I'm going to talk about is some of the work I've done on decision making. And in particular, I am interested in social influences on decision making. So how do the individuals that are surrounding you influence how you perceive what you have and what decisions you make about it? And I'm particularly interested in the concept of fairness, in part because it's something that people care largely about. Um, I probably don't have to explain this to you. This is a somewhat more dated photo now of Occupy Wall Street. But people really deeply care about the equity of distributions. And they not only care when they're the ones getting less, but they also care when they're the ones getting more. And a question that arises again and again is why should people care about this? After all, if you're getting enough to survive and reproduce, why should you care if somebody else is getting more? And yet we know people do. But of course, an important question is, why is this? Is this some sort of cultural phenomenon, in which case it's the way in which we're raising our offspring, or does it go more deeply than that? Given that I study non-human primates, you can probably guess that I think it goes more deeply than that. And if it does, we should be able to see some evidence of something related to a sense of fairness by looking at other species. Now, of course, they aren't going to have a sense of fairness in the same way we do. Quite obviously, I mean, they can't talk, so they can't sit around and talk about, you know, what Rousseau said or anything along those lines. But we can look at some of these basic behaviors that may tie into the human sense of fairness. But, of course, there's a problem there, because fairness is a social ideal. So even in humans, how do you really study it? It's not particularly tractable to break down for empirical research. And I'm sure there are many ways that you could do this, but the way that we got into it um, all starts with a monkey named Ozzy, who was, uh, he's a capuchin monkey, he still is a capuchin monkey. Um, he was the... <laughs> He's the alpha male, or was the alpha male of the group I was working in. And I was following my graduate advisor's advice to sit out and watch the animals and let them tell me what was important about their lives to give me ideas about what, was the most, what were the most interesting things to study. And one afternoon when I was sitting out there feeding them peanuts, which they like quite a lot, um, Ozzy was coming over and trying to get more and more peanuts, but of, and as the alpha male, he typically could, but I was trying to get peanuts to other individuals. And eventually, he ran away, and he started coming back with things and trying to trade them with me in order to get some of the peanuts. So he brought monkey chow, then he brought an orange peel, and that was interesting because he seemed to be increasing in value, but of course, all of these were things that were much less valuable to a capuchin monkey than to a peanut. And then he came back with a whole section of orange. It was about a quarter of an orange. And he shoved it through the mesh at me and reached out his hand like he wanted the peanut. 
And that caught my attention, because if you had asked me prior to that whether Ozzy would choose a peanut or a quarter of an orange, I would have said a quarter of an orange. I see you nodding over there. You agree with me. So this didn't really make sense. Why was he willing to give up something that I thought he actually preferred in order to get a peanut? Well, one possibility, of course, was that he wanted the peanut because everybody else was getting it. And so that got at the idea we had for looking at this. Possibly by looking at how individuals respond to unequal outcomes, we could find an empirical way to test whether or not they had this basic level of fairness. So obviously, just being upset when you get something less is not the same as a sense of fairness, but it gets us started in that direction. And conveniently at the time for my dissertation, I was doing a project with capuchin monkeys where we had them trading tokens back and forth for differently valued foods. And what we were interested in was whether or not they could learn that different tokens had different value, which is completely unrelated to what I'm going to talk about today, except for the fact that if you've already got a monkey in here trading a token with you, why not put another one next to them, have them trade a token, and give them a different food reward for it. So that's what we decided to do. So just to give you an overview of the test, and for those of you who've read any of this, there are probably close to a dozen different versions of this we've done, but I'm just going to focus on a few because I don't have too much time today. Um, first, you need to find out, of course, how the animals respond when their partner gets the same thing as them for doing the same test. So we're, what, this is what we call the equity control. How do I respond when I exchange and get a cucumber after watching you exchange and get a cucumber as well? And I should say that they all like cucumbers. If you walk in and hand them 10 or 12 pieces of cucumber, they happily eat all of them. And that's important because we're not interested in how they respond when they get something they don't like and somebody else gets something they like. We're interested in how they respond when somebody gets something better. So of course, we compare this to an inequity condition where I trade and get my cucumber after watching you trade and get a grape. So now I'm getting the same cucumber, but you got something better. And we're interested to see whether there's a difference in my response to this cucumber across these two conditions. But we really need one more condition, because there are actually two things that are different here. One is that you're getting a grape, and the other one is that my attention's being drawn to the grape, irrespective of who's getting it. Now, when we do these tests, we always have a bowl of cucumber and a bowl of grapes sitting out front, so they see grapes even in the equity condition, but their attention's not being drawn to it. And there's a long literature going back to Hernstein in psychology showing that there are contrast effects. Individuals compare what they've got to other things that they've had in the past or other things that are out there, and that's not social necessarily. And so we include what we call an equity plus grape condition. In that case, we wave the grape in front of them until they gesture towards it, which lets us know they saw it, drop it back in the bucket, do the trade, and give them the cucumber. And then we do the same thing for the partner. So we're drawing their attention to the grape actually twice as often. So if anything, we've biased it against our finding. Um, but then everybody only gets a cucumber, so it's still equitable. So by looking at these three conditions, we can try to tease apart how any changes in response here are due specifically to the partner getting the grape. So uh, going back to that uh, famous video clip, I'm going to show you here what the inequity condition looks like. So this is a monkey named Lance right here. And he's going to trade and get a cucumber. And then he's going to watch his partner, whose name is Winter, trade and get a grape. Where'd my mouse go? There it is. So. You can listen with, with, to it with sound on the video if you, on YouTube if you want. I like to talk over it. So he ate his cucumber. And now he's watching Winter. Winter trades. Winter gets a grape. And you can tell that he sees that. So Lance come back, comes back and trades. He gets a cucumber. Watch what he does. He takes a bite, so he accepts it. <laughs> <laughs> and then he makes his preferences known. <laughs> It is important to point out he's the only capuchin I know who can do aimed overhand throwing. <laughs> but this response is not atypical. <laughs> if you look at the actual empirical data rather than just how they're responding, you see that they refuse the cucumber twice as often in the inequity condition as they do in the other two conditions. And this is held true across multiple studies now. So they seem to care about what their partner got. And it's not just because their attention's being drawn to that grape, which actually I find interesting in and of itself. They put up with us tricking them, basically. But they get really upset when their partner gets something better. 
Um, we're actually going back now and trying to code these behavioral responses and see if we can figure out whether or not there are differences in behavioral response in the 80, or in behaviors in the 80% of the cases here where they aren't refusing. Um, because refusing something you actually like is very costly. So one might anticipate that there are other sorts of agitation or stress responses that we're going to get even when they're willing to accept it. So next we tested this with chimpanzees. Um, these are photos from a long time ago taken at the Yerkes Field Station. There actually are chimps down here in the shade. It gets hot in Atlanta, too. Um, and so we tested these two groups in particular because this group was an established social group that had been together for close to 30 years. So all the individuals in the group had grown up together. Whereas in this group, the individuals had been put together as adults about six years prior to the study, which means they had a good relationship, but it's not the same as having grown up together. Chimps typically would have a much more long-term relationship. But otherwise, these groups were pretty similar. They had the same number of animals, same basic demographics, and so forth. And we also looked at uh, some pair housed individuals, which is an exceedingly atypical social situation for a chimpanzee, because we wanted to see how social housing influenced their responses. What we found was interesting. Looking just at the short-term group in orange and the pair housed group in pink, you can see that they responded more strongly to inequity. Although interestingly, it was a much stronger effect compared to the equity plus grape condition with the pair housed individuals who don't have any other social outlets um, than with the short term group. But the sample size is small enough, it's hard to make much out of that right now. What's really interesting is the long term group's response. They didn't respond to anything. These are standard error bars right here, and there were 10 individuals in that sample. So that shows you that there was very, very low variability. So we got to wondering, in humans, we know that responses to inequity are much exacerbated for individuals with whom you don't have close relationships. So maybe these guys here have these well-established relationships, and it's not worth screwing them up over a cucumber versus a grape. But the problem is that these guys' relationships were confounded with how long they'd been living together, six years versus 30 years. So we tested this again at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Bastrop, Texas, who has all these social groups that have lived together in the similar sort of outdoor corral system since the late 70s. And so these guys had been together for close to 30 years, so we could disentangle any differences in social um, interactions from how long they'd been living together. So we ran the study again with 16 new chimpanzees, which for those of you who work with humans is a really big sample size for us, trust me. Um, and we got something totally unexpected. There was no influence of groups, but we found a sex effect. Males were responding more strongly to inequity than either equity or the equity plus grape condition. And interestingly, this difference is bigger. Whereas females didn't care about inequity, but they cared when we tricked them. They cared about this contrast condition. And going back and looking at the results from Yerkes, none of the males or female, none of the females showed this pattern at Yerkes. So this wasn't some sort of sex difference that had been hidden by a couple of outliers at Yerkes. It was really different. So it became clear to us that whatever was underpinning the variability in the inequity response was a lot more complicated than are you male, female, or are you from this social group or that social group. So next, we took four social groups of chimpanzees from MD Anderson. And we were interested in how they responded with different individuals. We thought this was relationship-based. We still were, I still think it probably is, but we were really, we were convinced that what was going on was that individuals were having different responses with individuals that they had close relationships with versus those that they didn't, and that our differences between the two um, different facilities were due to the fact that we were pairing individuals and we pr had tried to do it randomly, but probably inadvertently had introduced bias. So for each one of these groups, we paired every individual with every other individual in the social group with whom they would pair, and then did the same for this individual and this individual and so forth. And chimps won't pair with everybody. Um, really high-ranking individuals, um, lots of the lower-ranking individuals won't pair with them, and some of them don't like each other. But we got slightly more than half the possible pairs to form. It took us four years to do this. Um, and we were interested in comparing their inequity responses in each of these possible pairings to their relationship quality based on a separately collected um, set of data on how often they were, how much time they were spending grooming one another and so forth. And we also used the time they live in the same group as a separate measure of relationship quality. So we had two measures of relationship quality that we could tease apart statistically. And we also included their personality. It's controversial to some degree what personality is actually measuring in non-human animals. Animals, but what is clear is that personality is measuring very highly replicable long-term individual differences in behavior. I mean, we had those data from a separately collected study that one of my postdocs had done when she was a graduate student. 
So we got all these data, put them together, and it turns out, much to Sam Gosling, who was participating in this, this delight, um, it was personality that was driving the responses, not their relationship quality. So chimps like Kino here, who have really good relationships with lots of individuals, they're always grooming, they're outgoing, they spend lots of time interacting with others, were very responsive to inequity, but not so much to contrast. Whereas chimps that spent lots and lots of time interacting with humans and were really good at training and things like that, tended to be more responsive to contrast, which actually makes you wonder what they were responding to. Did they see us as the target, or, um, or was it really the fact that it was just the contrast? But that's a separate question. So again, it does seem like it's these stable individual differences that are driving responses. But of course, even in this case, where we're trying to pair everyone with everyone else, we're still missing one of the key features of chimpanzee social life, which is you don't usually see chimps like this. You see them like this, in a big cluster, all together, all interacting with one another. That's how, they, that's how they're typically living, but that's not how we're testing them. So what we're doing now, and these data are still in progress, so I don't have any actual data to show you, um, but both with chimpanzees at MD Anderson, with Katie Hall, who's my postdoc, and with capuchin monkeys at Georgia State, with Julia Watsik, who's one of my graduate students, we're doing the same thing, but we're doing it in a group setting. So I'll show you a video clip of how this looks, but we've got all the chimps who are outside. There's a bucket here of, um, we're actually not using cucumber and grapes for every one of them, but I'm gonna keep calling it that. You've got the grapes in one, you've got the cucumbers in the other, and any individual can come up and exchange. And we actually have three foods in this case. So what we're interested in is how much does um, chimp A, say Joey here, how much does Joey exchange for the medium value food when one or more individuals are getting a better food than him, and when one or more individuals are getting a less good food than him. So we had to introduce three foods since we obviously can't control how many exchanges they're getting and so forth. So if you look at this video, there's my cursor. Joey's been getting the lower value food while his partner here has been getting the higher value food and he's having a little chimp temper tantrum. <laughs> so we seem to be getting nice data showing that they do care and they're paying attention to one another. It's hard to see but there's another chimp back there too. Um, just to give you another example of what we've been getting, these are two chimps who've known each other for a very long time named Mary and Martha. So Martha here is trading and getting orange, and Mary's trading and getting uh, celery. And I don't know if you noticed, but Martha traded and got her orange and ate it. Mary's celery's piling up here. She's not eating it. <laughs> and she also, she done, watch this. Mary just stole Martha's orange, <laughs> which is something that we didn't see in the paired test, even though they were sharing an enclosure and next to each other in just the same way. So we're hoping that the social dynamics that we're gonna get from this will show us more about what's going on and possibly how relationship quality may be interacting with some of the uh, personality results we're finding and so forth. So all of this raises an interesting question. We've got clear evidence that they respond to these differences. Um, but what is the function of this behavior? Why did it evolve in the first place? Um, I could give a whole one hour lecture on that, so I'm gonna summarize in one slide at the risk of getting rid of a lot of the critical detail. You can come find me afterwards. Um, we've done, a, there is in the literature, especially in economics, it's been argued that it's related to cooperation. You, having a sense of inequity allows you to identify good cooperative partners and continue to interact with those partners and leave partners who are not so good. Um, so we've done lots of studies looking at how inequity influences cooperative ability in these guys and we find that it does. Um, but we've also been doing a comparative approach looking at how all these different species um, respond to inequity and comparing it to the tendency they have to cooperate in their natural environment. And what we find is that there's a pretty good match. So. Um, individuals that cooperate with non-kin, so group hunts, coalitions and alliances, um, either to attain rank or to keep out indivi individuals from other social groups and so forth, tend to respond very strongly to inequity, um, whereas those that don't have such strong tendencies to cooperate don't. Um, and it seems to correlate with that better than things like brain size or size of the social group. Now, admittedly, we only have nine different groups up here, so there's, there's certainly some room for error, but it looks promising. Um, one of the most interesting details, actually, is the fact that the cooperative breeders we've tested are not responding to inequity, but we think that's because in all three studies that have been done, we've used mated pairs. And in mated pairs, it's very expensive to go find a new partner. So losing your partner and your entire reproductive output for the year over a cucumber doesn't seem to make sense. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> so we think that the two of them are related. However, everything I've talked about thus far is how you respond when you get less, 
But fairness is not just responding when you get less than someone else. It's also responding when you get more. In humans, if I went around and got upset every time I found out I was making less money than somebody but didn't care when I found somebody who was more deserving than me, who was making less than me, you wouldn't say I was fair. You might say I was a jerk or that I was self-interested, but that's not the same thing. So we've also been looking at how or whether individuals respond when they get more. Of course, it's the negative responses to getting less are related to fairness, but they're, they're just one step. Um, one of the things, so essentially what we're interested in in these original studies is how does this guy respond to getting the grape? Um, how do, in that video you saw, how does Winter respond to the fact that she's continuing to get the grape while her partner gets the cucumber? So one of the other conditions we've done is a high value test where both of them exchange and get a grape. And using the same logic as the inequity test, if Winter responds differently to this grape when her partner also gets a grape than to this grape when her partner gets a cucumber, then we might argue that she notices this inequity. Um, capuchins don't seem to. But if you look at chimpanzees, we do see evidence that the male chimps in that study from MD Anderson, who if you recall were the only ones who responded to getting less than a partner, also refuse somewhat more often, and it is statistically significant, they refuse about twice as often when their partner gets the cucumber and they get the grape than when they both get the grape. So this seems to indicate that the chimps notice this. Now to put this in perspective, first of all, this doesn't mean that they're altruistic, it just means that they notice when they get more. It could be that they're afraid of repercussions later in the day. The other thing is, if you look at their responses to inequity when they're getting more, compared to the responses to inequity I showed you when they're getting less, they're clearly much more upset by getting less. I would argue that that's true of humans too. Not everybody agrees with me. Um, but there is, there is a change here. But the important thing is, yes, we do have evidence that they're noticing when they get more. We wanted to test this in a little more detail using a, a paradigm that was more designed to do this, using a version of the ultimatum game. Um, I'm going to skim over this because I'm betting many of you have heard of it, but essentially there are two players, a proposer and a responder. A repo proposer splits a cash endowment any way that they want. If the responder accepts the division, then they get the money as the proposer suggested. If the responder refuses it, nobody gets anything. Um, and in human societies, generally speaking, People offer 40 to 50 percent, and most people won't accept it if it's less than 30 or 40 percent. There's a lot of cultural variation and variation across game types, but people tend to offer more than the minimum and seem to want to seem to expect more than the minimum. Now we can't do this with chimpanzees, of course, because we can't explain to them how they're supposed to take these grapes or whatnot and divvy them up between individuals. But we can do a limited form game where the proposer was trained to choose tokens, one of which represented a 5-1 split and one of which represented a 3-3 split, and then the responder can decide whether or not to accept the reward. The way we did this, for those of you who aren't used to working with chimps, is we first trained the proposer that the blue token gave them five, five of the rewards and the red token gave them three of the rewards. Then we put them in a preference test condition where they were sitting next to a social partner who was from their social group. They were separated by mesh so that they couldn't steal each other's food. And we had two conditions. One was a preference condition. And this was a, uh, we did this to establish a baseline preference between the options. The proposer chose a token, returned it to the human experimenter, who then divided the six, uh, actually it was banana slices, six banana slices that were out there between the two animals, pushed them forward and gave them the food the way it had been determined. We compared the proposer's choices for the blue token versus the red token to the ultimatum game condition where after the proposer made a choice, they had to pass the token through the mesh to their partner who then had to, could return it to the experimenter. And if they returned it to the experimenter, the experimenter divided up the tokens, the, or the banana slices the way that it was indicated. What we expected to see was responders refusing to return the token. That's not what we actually did see. What we saw was perhaps more interesting. We only did 12 trials, which is a very, very small number of trials, but we didn't want to get them, we didn't want to see too much in learning effects. And what we found was that the chimp showed, no, uh, expect, as we expected, a very high preference for the 5 1 token when it was just the preference condition, but that flipped in the ultimatum game condition, and they preferred the token that gave them only three and gave their partner three about 65% of the time. And we also tested this in young children in a daycare setting who were tested with kids from their daycare class. Um, so we could also sort of control for the level of uh, relationship. 
and we used stickers instead of banana slices, and we got the same thing with the kids. The kids also never ever refused, and they flipped their preferences. So we would argue that what we're seeing here is that in a non-anonymous, non-stranger, non-one-shot situation with someone you know you're going to act, interact with later today and tomorrow and the day after that and so forth, this may be a more rational response. So they aren't refusing, but we did see some communication. We saw chimps doing things like banging on the mesh and spitting water on one another. Kids were saying things like, why didn't you pick the other one? That's not fair, um, which seems to be rather obvious communication. So it might have been a subtle form of punishment. You didn't pick the one I liked. If you don't do this in the future, maybe I'm not going to reward you the way you want. Um, and we would argue that this is actually much cheaper and better, you're better off in the long run doing this when it's an individual where you have a long-term relationship. Because in this case, then you can change their behavior and continue to get the better reward. Whereas if you just refuse and don't play with them anymore, you lose out on future opportunities as well. So taking all of these results together, um, recently uh, Franz de Waal and I made an argument that the evolution, we do see evidence for the evolution of fairness in other species. We see good evidence for it. That doesn't mean, again, that other species have a sense of fairness. But what we propose is that the first thing you would expect to emerge is what we call first order inequity aversion or first order fairness. Basically, you've got two individuals. One gets something more, one gets something less good. The one who gets something less good protests. They throw their cucumber at the experimenter. They get agitated and pitch a temper tantrum. They steal their partner's orange. They do something that, that shows a protest. Um, but individual A doesn't really do anything. This is not a sense of fairness in and of itself, but this is a precursor. You're noticing these different rewards, and you're, you're upset about it. Presumably, that protest is trying to rectify the situation, but that doesn't need to be the case. In the second order, you have the same initial situation. You get more than I get less. I start to protest. But in this case, individual A tries to forestall B's protest by equalizing the outcomes. It doesn't mean they have to share everything. I intentionally put only a single grape out of that bunch here. It could just be something small to get across the point. You know, we're trying to help. Yes, you know, your salary is much less than everybody else's, but we're going to give you a small bonus this year and hopefully, you know, do some cost sharing. Hopefully they'll feel better about it. If that happens, then individual B's protest may go away, and importantly for both of them, the relationship continues. So we think this has a very strong, um, this is probably very strongly selected because individuals can maintain this cooperative relationship and keep going. Whereas if there's just protest and individual A doesn't do anything, the relationship may fall, fall apart, which again means you don't get these continued benefits from cooperation. Of course, the only evidence we've seen for this outside of humans right now is in the chimps. I don't think that's the only place we will see evidence for it, but I suspect that this requires a high enough degree of planning, um, forethought, maybe ability to inhibit because you have to give up something you really like in order to forestall this protest that we might not see it expect, except in some really highly um, um, encephalized species. Um, things like elephants, cetaceans, probably the other apes and so forth. Um, and of course, in humans, we've taken this much further. Humans have unparalleled ability to plan and so forth. But by studying these other species, we can learn about the roots of human fairness, which may help us to better understand situations like Occupy Wall Street, because now we know it's not just, just a cultural phenomenon, um, but we can talk, start thinking about the underpinning, underlying biological um, aspects of it. So this work takes an enormous amount of time and effort and money, so I would like to thank all the people who've worked on all these projects through the years, and thank you.